start talking about the application of the manual and how important it is that it gets used. One of the things that people don't quite recognize is that each state has its own practice for how to consider the costs and the benefits of different DERs. And even worse, most states that I'm aware of use a different approach to look at energy efficiency that they do for demand response as they do for DG or that they do for storage. There's this crazy mismatch even within a state as to how you look at the costs and the benefits. And as a result, you can't do a, a reasonable comparison of efficiency with storage because you don't have the metrics to compare apples to apples. And if you regulate electricity and gas, there might be different inconsistent uh, approaches for the different fuels, for example. Yes. And so one of the things we did in the manual that I think is extremely helpful is we introduced a set of cost and benefit analysis principles. And one of the key ones is that all distributed energy resources should be evaluated using consistent practices. And those should be compared with traditional resources using consistent practices and assumptions. So that's key. And that's going to change how states look at all these distributed energy resources to see how they compare and how they compare with what would be done in their absence. So on that, I, I have a slide just to show one way that this can help. And it's a slide of benefit cost ratios. And for those who aren't, you know, neck deep in this all the time, a benefit cost ratio is a very simple way to take the benefits, divide them by the costs. And if the ratio exceeds one, it's cost effective. And therefore it could be a good investment. It doesn't have to be, you know, adopted just because of it. If you do adopt this particular resource, you know you're going to get benefits that exceed the cost. So on this chart, you can see we've, we've grouped the different types of DERs. That The top is electrification. Below that, we have energy efficiency, storage, demand response, and distributed generation. And within each of those, there's a whole variety of different options, whether it's a different policy option for how to achieve it, or whether for energy efficiency, it's a program directed at small customers versus large customers versus residential customers. And in this chart, we identify the 1.0 benefit cost ratio as the threshold for what is cost effective. Anything that exceeds it is cost effective. And here you can see right away, oh, you get to compare one resource versus another. And you can see, for example, that energy efficiency has a lot of strong programs, but some of them are stronger than others. Distributed generation, again, it depends upon whether you're serving residential or small c customers. So this is just a simplistic way of getting a quick snapshot of different resources. Now this gets much more interesting when you take it at a further level. So I'm gonna to go to my next slide for that, which is same idea, it's been rotated, what, 90 degrees, but you see the benefit cost ratios on the y-axis. And here we've very simply combined the different types of DERs into just categories of efficiency, demand response, distributed PV, and so forth. And here we have three tests for each type of resource. The utility system test, which just has the basic utility system impacts. The societal test, which includes greenhouse gases, jobs, and, and a variety of other uh, things that might affect society. In this case, we have a jurisdiction-specific test that includes the utility system impacts, but it also includes greenhouse gas emission reductions and other fuel impacts. The reason that other fuel impacts are important is that when you have things like electrification and electric vehicles, then you have other fuels that are outside of the utility system scope, but are nonetheless critical to making decisions about the resources. So I'm going to just give a quick overview of, of what this handy way of looking at things consistently can tell you. And again, you don't see any of these graphs in any state that I've worked in so far, because if you have different tests for different resources, you can't put them all in one place. But, but here I've done that. So first of all, energy efficiency does pretty well under any test. It generally is very low cost. Demand response also does well, but it doesn't have quite the same benefits. This gets interesting when you get to distributed photovoltaics, where under the utility system test, a lot of people don't know this, but it's wildly cost effective because most distributed PV policies require the customers to pay for the solar on their roof, whether they pay for it up front themselves or whether they lease their roof to a developer or whether they get a loan and the developer helps subsidize it that way. 
either way, the utility pays almost nothing. The customer that's installing it, so the participant or the, and, and so the other utility customers are not really pitching in and directly toward the installation cost. Exactly. And so this looks fantastic. And if you were just to stop at that blue bar, we should have rooftop PV on every house in the country, as long as it's facing in a reasonably good direction. But there's more to the story, which I'll get to in my next set of slides. On this slide, then, storage is a little more interesting of a story. It's much more complicated than any of the other resources here because of the way that it can contribute to markets and to the electric grid really quickly and address specific needs, whether it's a distribution peak or a peak on the transmission system or ancillary services. So that's a fairly complicated story. But a lot of the benefits from storage come in the way of those utility benefits I just mentioned. Whereas while storage can be a really useful way to facilitate other DERs that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, storage in and of itself doesn't have huge greenhouse gas emission benefits. This particular graph shows storage all by itself, not sort of interacting with other DERs. And as a result, it doesn't look as good as it does under the utility cost test. Now, electrification in EVs, you can see right away that from the electric utility perspective, they don't look good at all because they basically increase electric costs and the electric system benefits are often less than those costs. And I should say that the utility system here is defined as the electric utility system. Therefore, it doesn't include other fuels. It doesn't include gasoline savings for electric vehicles and it doesn't include natural gas savings for electrification. So it's just not a reasonable test to even use because it's just a slice of the whole picture and it just doesn't make any sense. But then you add in, in the jurisdiction specific test, the other fuels and you add in the greenhouse gas benefits and suddenly these look really good. And in this case, there are a, a small and societal impacts that are beyond just other fuels and greenhouse gases, but they tend to be fairly small. The same story is true for EVs. Now, what's also interesting about this is that if a regulator, whether it's a commissioner or a legislator or anybody, is sitting there thinking, you know, my job is just to reduce utility system costs. That's it. If that's all their job is, then you're not going to get any electrification in any EVs. However, the jurisdiction-specific test is defined as including those goals that are a part of the regulator's jobs, including those goals like reducing greenhouse gas emissions and so forth, that in many states are clearly a part of the commission's jobs, whether it's because they have a Global Warming Solutions Act or they have some kind of uh, CO2 targets or whatever. So while that red bar that you see, the societal cost test, might give some regulators some concerns because it's outside the scope of their authority, the orange bar is by definition clearly within their scope of their authority. You know, you could delete uh, the blue and the red bars here and you could see then how regulators could look at these different resources and compare across each other. So Tim, to make this graph, are the jurisdiction specific impacts here representing policies across the nation? No, no, good question. This is a hypothetical graph just to illustrate all the points I just made. This doesn't represent actual numbers from any one technology or any one state, nor does it represent any one particular a jurisdiction. What we did here was come up with a jurisdiction specific test that is just like the utility system, but it also includes participant costs, it includes other fuels, and it includes greenhouse gases. So that's like a, a hypothetical example of a jurisdiction specific test, which in my mind is a pretty good test. Most states care about other fuels. Most states care about climate change, or if they don't now, they, they should. So in my mind, that's a great test. And it also, as I said earlier, avoids some of the concerns people have about overreach and, and being too broad. Is there a legal question where the individual commissioners of the commission might care about, say, climate change and burning gasoline and, and vehicles and the health effects of that and so on, but they are not legally allowed to consider such things in their, say, electric utility planning decisions? Yeah, there are some states where Either it's vague and, and just not clear at all, or in some cases it might even be prohibited. I think there have been a couple of states where legislators have said, we, you know, we don't want you to look at greenhouse gases or, you know, so forth. So 
what we've said is that the state energy goals are not only are they dictated within each state, but they're also uh, something that can evolve over time. And so if a state has a particular goal that's too ambiguous, too vague, it's not really clear about you know, what can be included or not, well, that's where stakeholders come in and the commissions come in and say, all right, this is statutory interpretation, something that regulators do all the time. And they say, based upon the statutes we have, we have authority to do X, and that's the scope of what they can do. Now, if there are stakeholders in the state who feel like that's not the energy goals of this state, then they can make that case and, and actually argue for you know, including those goals. Further, if it really is prohibited or really excluded for some reason by legislation, well, they can always go and change legislation. That's how things happen in this industry. It's, it's not uncommon at all. 